Hey y'all, Coach Nefi here, talking about the Feast of First Fruits. Now, normally we give classes talking about when First Fruits is, and we will do so again for the year 2021 because there is a lot of misconceptions on when the true date of First Fruits is. So look for those classes to come out here pretty soon, Lord willing. But in this class, we're actually going to talk about what is first fruits. Now, one of the places that we hear about the Feast of First Fruits is over in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, which is the chapter that has all of the festival days in it, including the Sabbath day. And we'll touch on these verses 9 through 22 a lot more when we talk about the win of the Feast of First Fruits. But for this class, the main parts that I want to bring out is how first fruits is actually a time appointed for us to make offerings to the Lord. You see that at the beginning in verse 13, how an offering is being made, a wave offering. And you hear about another offering made at the end of the Feast of First Fruits or the date known as Pentecost. You heard of people paying tithes? Well, the way the scripture is written, Pentecost is the one time in the year that you're actually supposed to pay tithes. That's why you hear people say tithes and offerings. Well, the offerings are made during the rest of the year, while the tithes are made really only one time in the year. And that's during the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks, which is 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits starts. Now, one of the first places that you hear about the Feast of First Fruits mentioned is actually in the book of Jubilees in chapter 6. Verse 21 calls it the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of First Fruits. And then it says that this feast is twofold and of a double nature. The other nature to the Feast of First Fruits is the law or the descendant of the Holy Spirit or all of that other stuff you hear around Pentecost. But in this class, we're primarily focusing on the sacrifices, the offerings, and the tithes element of the Feast of First Fruits. Verse 22 says, For I have written in the book of the first law, in that which I have written for thee, that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season, one day in the year, as I explained to thee, as sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month, one day in every year. So what it's telling us here is like we said earlier, these offerings that are to be made to our father are to occur one time in a year during the Feast of First Fruits or the Feast of Weeks. And notice that it says throughout your generations meaning that this is supposed to last for forever. And we were reminded of this over in Matthew chapter 23 and 23, when the Messiah chastised the church leaders of the day that they were required to pay tithes. We see in Proverbs verse 3 and 9, where it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy firstfruits of all thine increase. We have to remember that the Lord wants to be our provider. And when we obey his commandments, we allow him to do so. But we are required to give a tithe of those provisions that he provides us with. We see in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 40, where he's talking about the house of Israel, who have come to serve him in these holy mountains. And to understand these mountains, you must jump over to the book called The Shepherd of Hermas in Similitudes 9. But notice there where it says, there I will accept them and there I will require their offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. So we see that the father is serious about these offerings. Matter of fact, you see the tone change a little bit when you get over to Malachi chapter three, where verse eight says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. So it's talking about how these children of Israel are actually robbing the Most High. It says, but you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Meaning that the children of Israel who are receiving these blessings are not paying their tithes and their offerings. 
But notice in verse 9 where it says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So the punishment for not paying these tithes and offerings is that we are cursed with a curse. Then it goes on to talk about those who would actually pay the tithes. It says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open your windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So those who are not paying the tithes are under a curse, while those who are are receiving a blessing. And if you think about it, it makes sense. These tithes and these offerings are what keeps our father's ministry going. We're going to see here that his people are actually dependent on these tithes and offerings for their survival. So if you, being a good steward, are paying tithes and offerings to keep his church going, doesn't it make sense that he would provide you with an increase so that you could actually do more? But we'll come back to that. So now if you want to get an idea of what that curse would actually look like, you could come over to Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 31. Where it says, and if a man will at all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add thereunto a fifth part thereof. Meaning that if you don't pay tithes, or if for some reason you withhold your tithes for that year, then the amount that you was supposed to offer at first has been increased by 20%. So you can imagine all of these people who are receiving the blessings of the father, but have not given him these tithes for all of these many years. Well, the scripture is always true and it will never come back void. So you can imagine these years of 20 percent adding up, causing their material possessions or their wealth to be cursed. So now we've talked about what the tithes are. They are the increase that the Lord provides us with. And we've talked about which day it is that we're supposed to offer these tithes, which is on the day they call Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Some call it Shavuot or the Feast of First Fruits. But now let's talk about who's actually supposed to get these tithes. And we look over in Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 30. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all and every sort of your oblations shall be to the priests. So the priests, and we're going to find out that it includes the Levites here shortly. It says, ye shall also give unto the priests the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. So when you hear me say that we are supposed to give this tithe unto the Lord, we do so by giving our first fruits to the priests. Over in the book of Jubilees in chapter 13, we see in verse 25 that Abram was instructed to give the tenth of all of his first fruits unto the priests. That would be why he paid tithes to Melchizedek, who was not only the king of Salem at the time, but was the priest of the Most High God. Abraham wasn't just giving money to some random person. Those tithes and offerings are supposed to go to a very specific people. We see in chapter 32 of the same book, verse 15 says, And all the tithes of the oxen and sheep shall be holy unto the Lord, and shall belong to the priests, which they will eat before him from year to year. For thus it is ordained and engraven regarding the tithes of the heavenly tablets. See, you have to understand how this all works. The priests and the Levites job was to do the services of the Lord and to take care of the temple. Unlike the rest of the population who would have been farmers or fishermen or carpenters, the priests and the Levites only job was at the temple. And the way the father provided for them and their families was through tithes and offerings. So here you have this guy who has devoted his time to study in the word of God and making sure the rest of us know what's going on. Those who are benefiting from what he does are now required to give 10% of their increase to allow him to feed his family. Otherwise, the children of these priests would be hungry or the priests would have to put down his Bible and go somewhere and pick up a shovel or a hoe. Over in Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 44, it says... And at that time were some appointed over the chambers of the treasures for the offerings, 
for the first fruits and for the tithes to gather unto them out of the fields of the cities of the portions of the law for the priests and Levites. So here we see that it is not only the priests who are supposed to get these tithes, but it is also the Levites. So let's take a moment and let's discuss who these people actually are. The priests and the Levites. If somehow you think that we are talking about those guys down in those fancy robes at the mass, you're sadly mistaken. First, let's talk about the Levi. We look over here in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, which says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the wound among the children of Israel, both of men and of beasts, it is mine. So here we are talking about the firstborn. He's not only talking about the firstborn of all the cattle and dogs and everything else in the world, but he's specifically talking about the firstborn of humans. Those, he say, belong to him. And he uses them for his purposes, whether they be good, as in serving in the temple or the tabernacle, but he can also use them for bad because they are his to do what he pleases with them. The firstborn of every family is set apart for his services. Now, when we look at Numbers chapter 3 and 12, it says, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So here we make a connection between the firstborn and the Levites. You have to remember that the stories back there during Moses' time were living parables and examples of what's to happen in the future during our time. And what is telling us here in this scripture is that even though the firstborn of all of the tribes were his, like we talked about over there in Exodus chapter 13, he's saying that instead of taking the firstborn and putting them in service, he actually chose the entire tribe of Levi to be this service. And it makes sense that he would choose one tribe to do the work in the tabernacle, else each tribe would have had to send all of their firstborn to the tabernacle to do the services. And you remember in the scripture that they were told to stay separate in their different cities with their own tribes. Well, if all of the firstborn from each tribe was required to leave their city and go to where the temple was, that would have called a mixture of all of the tribes. And the firstborn of the forefathers of the Messiah wouldn't have been in Nazareth. They would have actually been in Jerusalem. No. We see down in verse 41 that he says that he took the Levites for himself instead of the firstborn. So back in that time, the firstborn were allowed to stay in their homes. Now, the Sadducees would have been the representation of the Levites and the Levitical priests. But we've done away with those systems altogether with the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. And our father in his infinite wisdom knew this. So that's why he set it up beforehand that his ministers in the end times would actually be the Levites. This is actually who he's talking about over in the book of Malachi and chapter 3. Which is the same chapter we were reading about where it says, will ye rob God? Well, notice back in verse 3 that he's talking about purifying the sons of Levi. What this is talking about is the day of the Lord and the regathering of the father's people. Well, we're learning here in Malachi in chapter 3 that he's actually going to start with the Levites. He's going to start with the firstborns. These are going to be the people who will rise up to be our ministers. And it is actually a great way to do it when you think about it. Because every family has a Levi. Either it's yourself, if you are the oldest of your siblings, or if you open the matrix, meaning that you are the first child of your mother, or it is your oldest brother or your oldest sister. That is who it is that it is supposed to be in services of the Lord. In other words, you're not supposed to go down to the church or go down to the cathedral or the temple or wherever to get spiritual advice. 
you're actually supposed to go to the Levite in your own family. See, that's how it was supposed to work. And that's why there's so many problems and confusion in the church today, because most of the people who are standing behind the pulpit are not actually biblically qualified to be there. And I say that because I've asked them. I've been to hundreds, maybe thousands of churches in my life. And a lot of times I will ask the preacher or the pastor if he has any older brothers or sisters. And to him, it may seem like casual conversation, but for the rest of us, we understand that this individual, even though he has all of these robes and crosses and his huge congregation, is not actually qualified to teach the word of God. He shouldn't be there. And this is why there's so much confusion in the church, because not only has he set himself up as a minister of the Most High, but he's elevated himself above the Levites and the Levitical priests. This all started back in the Catholic Church when they rejected the true ministers of the Father and established their own priests from vile men out of the community. In other words, just like they do today, they chose the people to lead the congregation that would agree with their agenda. And today that agenda can be learned down at the seminaries where they are actually teaching these people to be agents of the state. In other words, through their schooling and their certifications, they have established common people, people who are not Levites or priests, they have established them in these churches to teach a government-sanctioned religion. All while the people who are supposed to be holding those positions are being rejected many of which are now caught up in it, this Egyptian type culture and are thinking that their only way to provide for their family is to go out and get a job and you can definitely hear the devil in the details when you think about how we have selected anybody who sounds good and can deliver a convincing message to stand as the authority figures of the church all while the true ministers are forced to put down the scripture and get jobs in order to feed their families. Now, if this sounds like I take this personally, I am a Levite. I served as a Levite for 25 years. Even before I knew what a Levite was, the father had called me into that ministry and I have been in service of the tabernacle since 1996. So not only am I a firstborn, but I have actually been active in the ministry and I only turned 50 in January of this year. When I graduated from being a Levite and was promoted to a Levitical priest, having read the Bible from Genesis to Revelations three complete times, and have read all of the Apocrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Lost Books of the Bible, the Forgotten Books of Eden, and a half a dozen other scriptural documents that you probably never heard of, I know what the scripture says. And I have been doing my best to actually teach the scripture for many, many years. So you can imagine my frustration when my competitors those that are teaching a false doctrine and a false hope are collecting the tithes money that was actually supposed to come to people like me are now using these tithes and these offerings only to support their materialistic lifestyle all while they teach a doctrine that's not consistent with the scripture and is not beneficial to our salvation but anyway let's continue on with our study back over here in numbers chapter 18 Verse 24 says, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer for an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel, they have no inheritance. So imagine that. Our Father in His infinite wisdom decided to withhold the inheritance of the Levites, chose to give them the offerings of the tithes from the children of Israel for their inheritance. 
So that's what Malachi is talking about when he says, will you rob God? Because if you're not giving these tithes to the Levites or to the priests, you're actually withholding the inheritance of these people whose job it is to bring us the word of God. So the way this is all going to work, and I'm not a prophet or anything. I'm just basing what I'm saying off of the scripture that I've read. And that is that those Levites, those firstborn who have kept the feast of Passover are now being regathered to the father's fold. And he's going to start converting these people over to ministers. Talking about your older siblings and the rest of the firstborn members of your community. You'll start to see a change in these people as they start to embrace the scripture and what the word actually says. You'll start to see changes in their lifestyle. Some of them will actually be leaving their jobs in pursuit of a full time ministry. Well, you who will actually be benefiting from that ministry are now required to give them tithes and offerings out of everything that you get. On the Feast of Pentecost is when you will give them 10% of all of your increase. And during the rest of the year, you give them offerings of everything that you get. For instance, if you go to the store and you buy a dozen eggs, you're actually supposed to give the Levite one of those eggs. If you put 10 gallons of gas in your car, you're actually supposed to give the Levite a gallon of gas. That is how he gets to drive around while you get to pursue other ambitions. Now, this ain't the first time that I've talked about this. Normally, when I give a class like this, I keep my distance because I don't want to be accused of asking people for money. So all of these years that I've been in the ministry, I've never asked people for money. And I'm not going to start now, but I do make it known to you that I offer you the opportunity to send tithes and offerings to this ministry as a courtesy to you because I know how it is knowing that you are obligated to pay a tithe but are not sure where you're supposed to send that money to and don't want it to go to the wrong place that's why we put links in the description of this video that you could choose to send monetary tithes to this ministry and an email address in case you wanted to send non-monetary tithes to this ministry. So if you don't have an active Levite or a priest in your family right now and you are benefiting from this ministry, consider using one of the apps below to send a monetary offering. Or if your gift is non-monetary, send me an email. But like I said, we offer you that opportunity to send tithes and offerings to this ministry as a courtesy my family and I stepped off the grid in 2015 and to this day I'm not a member of what's known as the Egyptian culture meaning I don't have water bills light bills telephone bills insurance bills the only bill that comes in our mailbox is the internet bill that we use to upload these classes and the land tax bill which is from the hillbilly homestead which we're working to build as a refuge for those who survive the day of the Lord. In other words, the monetary gifts that you send here are used to pay the internet bill or to supply the computer and other electronics used to make those videos. Or they go towards building this homestead where we are building an environment conducive to human survival after the apocalypse. And just so you know, we have been good stewards over the monetary gifts that you guys have sent in. The major purchases have been this computer that I'm using because the old one died and a hand powered water pump that should arrive here in the middle of June, allowing us to get water from the ground without electricity or gasoline. But no matter where you decide to send your tithes and your offerings, be at least sure that you're sending them to a biblically qualified minister. Else you could be providing funds for those who are actually trying to destroy the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you're thinking that giving tithes and offerings to the father's ministers is just an Old Testament mandate, 
Let's come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and let's see what Paul had to say about it. In verse 9, you see him quoting Moses when he says, We shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Well, you look in verse 10, you see what he's talking about when he says, O save he it all together for our sake, for our sakes no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker in his hope. See, what he is talking about is how humanity, under the instruction of these ministers, will reap an increase from the Lord. And these ministers should also partake in that increase. Verse 11 says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Meaning these people will have helped you spiritually, which is of a greater benefit than anything material. Should you then mind sharing some of these material things with the ministers? Look down in verse 13. He says, do you know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? He's reminding us that we have to take care of those who are doing the Lord's work. And in verse 14, he says, Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live by the gospel. Meaning, those responsible for teaching the word of God are supposed to live off of that ministry. Unlike you see with most ministers that only preach on the weekend and then work a job from nine to five. Our father's ministers are expected to be ministers every day. That is their job. That is what they do. Then let's come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, which says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And this should remind us of what Malachi was saying over in chapter 3, where he says that if we do bring the tithes into the storehouse, that he will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Paul also goes on to say, every man according to his purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So, I say again, if you are benefiting from this ministry, please consider using one of the links below to support us. And by sending these tithes into the storehouse, you can be sure that our Father will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough for you to receive.